incentive to prepare for that exam, which is uh, on Wednesday the 27th. Um, so I'll try and grade these as quickly as possible. I don't know whether I'll have time to get them done by Friday, but I'll get the scores into the grade book soon. Um, the next thing on your plate is uh, design project phase two. And just to refresh the expectations there, you need to upload two PDF files. One of the PDF files should be your network map under the design flow condition. And remember, you need to turn off the background image. For me to be able to see the annotations on your network map, it's by far easier to do that if the background image is just temporarily switched off when you print. Uh, don't take a screenshot um, because that won't give sufficient resolution. So print to the PDF like I demonstrated in a prior class period. If you print to PDF, then that allows me to zoom in on it and see the annotations and try and understand. So you have to be able to tell me what's the pressure at each junction, what's the diameter of the pipe, what's the elevation of the reservoir. Without those annotations, I'm not able to understand your design or give you feedback. I won't be able to know whether it's a good design or a bad design. So those annotations are absolutely critical. They have to be visible and clear for me to be able to assess your work. So that's due on Friday, and then you've got spring break next week. And then um, after you get back from spring break on Wednesday the 27th, the next homework assignment is due, as well as having the exam. Um, so I'll uh, tell you the answers to that homework assignment, just so you can know as you're working through it whether you've got the right idea on those problems. Because you, know, you won't have your work graded prior to the exam if you're submitting it that same day. But are there any questions on the announcements before we continue talking about chokes and contractions and expansions today? So specific energy diagrams. I was thinking about putting an open-ended question on your quiz that said this. What is a specific energy diagram? So think about what would you have responded? What would you write? if that had been the quiz question today. So maybe a good way to start would just be to think about what is on each axis and what are its units. So in a specific energy diagram, on the horizontal axis, we have specific energy, which is in units of feet. And then on the vertical axis, we have depth in units of feet. I guess I should say units of length, because it could also be meters. But there is a characteristic curve in a specific energy diagram. And what it indicates is for a given flow section, meaning for a channel width or for a, uh, a channel just geometry, you know, it's so wide, it has certain side slopes and so on. And um, for a certain flow rate, what is the range of combinations of depth and velocity that can convey a certain amount of flow? So it's for a certain Q and like channel geometry. So I'm just drawing a little channel here to indicate that we've got some, some stream or canal or channel of some sort. We're putting a certain flow rate through, and then we vary the slope. Some of the slopes are shallow. Some of the slopes are deep. And we want to know what is y and v. Because there's, there could be some flow rates that are really shallow, but it has a high velocity. There could be some flow rates where it's really deep and it has a low velocity. But this curve is a graph of how much specific energy there is for each of them. And so some of the characteristics of this curve is that for any certain amount of specific energy, there are two crossing points on the specific energy diagram. And does anybody remember what we call it when there are two crossing points on the specific energy diagram? Alternate depths. Very good. That's right. So the alternate depths say for a certain amount of specific energy, there could be a supercritical depth and a subcritical depth. And what's this point that's to the far left 
of our specific energy diagram. What's it associated with? <laughs> Critical depth. Good. So this is y sub c, and it's also, what is this point if we go down and intercept the uh, horizontal axis? The minimum specific energy, E minimum. So it's the, the least amount of energy required to get that water flowing through the channel without choking. So it's really important to understand the fundamentals of what the specific energy diagram is. It's not enough just to plug numbers into equations. That's kind of what we did for our quiz today. It was mostly putting numbers into equations. But to really answer the big questions, you have to know what it all means. And I think the specific energy diagram is a good way to go back to fundamentals and try and say, well, why is it doing it this way? And what does it all mean? So this is where we left off last time. We had water flowing along in a channel at a depth of 10 feet. And if we put an obstacle in there that is as deep as the water itself, then it's obvious that water is going to have to pool to overcome that object. We talked about the uh, critical step height, uh, delta Z C. Remember that as we make the step height deeper and deeper and deeper, eventually it'll get so tall that the water doesn't have enough energy to get over it. So if, if we put in just a block into the channel that's as deep as the water, then the water has to pool to get over that block. And the question is, how much? Let's calculate that for the first time. If we put in a sill that was 10 feet deep, and what we know is that the water will flow at the critical depth over the obstacle. Now, how do we know that? Why is the water going to flow at the critical depth? Why doesn't it flow at some other depth over that obstacle? Does anybody know why the water is flowing at the critical depth and not some other depth? What is the critical depth associated with? Minimum specific energy. So it flows at the critical depth because that is the depth that requires the least amount of energy. And this pooling that occurred upstream, the water's getting deeper deeper, deeper, until just the bare minimum. It will stop rising when it doesn't have to rise anymore because it'll rise only until there's enough energy to get the water over the obstacle. And when there is enough energy and it's back in equilibrium, flow over this obstacle, the flow rate into the control volume that we're looking at is equal to the flow out. So it flows at YC because that's the most efficient flow depth to convey this flow that uh, needs to be passing through the area. So here's what I'd like you to do. Let's consider this as a rectangular channel that is carrying 500 CFS. OK, so we're in traditional units. The bottom width is 10 feet. The flow depth is 10 feet. And we want to find out how deep will the water upstream get because of this obstacle that we just put in the way? Let's find the Y prime one. Y one is the upstream depth prior to the uh, non-uniform flow being induced. Y prime one is the new depth after pooling occurs. So let's find out, and the way we do that is we're gonna find how much energy is required to get over the obstacle. So the total energy we need is going to be the minimum specific energy plus the height of the obstacle itself, the delta Z. That's how much energy needs to accumulate at one in order to get over the obstacle. So what you should calculate is what is the critical depth. So find YC for this scenario. And then find E minimum. What's the shortcut I told you, the relationship about specific energy and critical depth when the water's flowing at the critical depth? What is E minimum in terms of critical depth? You remember that shortcut? It's the two thirds slash three halves relationship. So the minimum specific energy is three halves Y sub C. 
All right, so here's what you need to do. One, find y sub c, and then two, find e minimum. All right, so let me pause for a moment while you go through those calculations. Of course, remember that y sub c is slope unit width squared divided by g to the one-third power. So same thing you did on the quiz. Find the critical depth, the minimum specific energy, and then we'll do the second bullet point together. Okay, so if we go through and calculate the uh, critical depth, I think you should have 4.265 feet is the critical depth. And then the minimum specific energy is 6.398 feet. If we just multiply that critical depth by three halves. Okay, so what is the total energy required to flow over the obstacle? So E required is going to be the uh, minimum plus the delta Z. So the minimum specific energy is 6.398 feet plus the 10 feet obstacle height. So we need 16.398 feet of energy before the water can flow over that obstacle. So the question is, how much energy did we initially have at one? I mean, I think we can tell just by inspection, just by maybe instinct and logic, that the water is going to pool. But let's prove it to ourselves that there wasn't enough specific energy at one initially to satisfy this requirement of 16.4 feet. Like, why did it pool? So here in step four, the proof that it was going to pool was the, we'll call it the E available, the initial amount of energy that was available at location one upstream was the depth plus the velocity head. So y1 plus flow per unit width squared divided by 2g depth squared. And that's the depth at location 1. So if we put in the, uh, the depth initially was 10 feet and the uh, flow per unit width was 50 feet squared per second squared divided by 2 times 32.2 feet per second squared multiplied by 10 feet, which was the uh, initial flow depth squared. So this velocity head component is only 0 0.388 feet. So the total specific energy that was initially available is 10.388 feet. So what's the comparison that we're going to do here? We're going to compare how much energy was available to how much is required. Let me just kind of uh, bring some of these calculations we've already done into the recording. So we calculated the critical depth, the minimum specific energy, the initial amount that's, well, to get over the obstacle of that 10 foot sill, we need 16.4 feet of energy. How much did we have available prior to pooling? We only had 10.4. So E required is more than E available, so choking will occur. We already kind of, we guessed that was the case, but now here's the proof. Choking will occur. So how deep will the water get? It'll get deep enough to provide the 16.4 feet of specific energy that's required. So it will get deeper and deeper until there's 16.4 feet of energy. So that'll include the depth, and the velocity head. Now it's mostly going to be comprised of depth. When the water gets that deep, its velocity is pretty low. So most of that uh, additional specific energy that accumulates upstream will be an increase of depth. So here's how we find the new upstream depth. We say we're going to set the E required. So we have to have 16.4 feet of energy to get over that obstacle. And so it's going to be the depth 
and the velocity head, where y prime 1 is the unknown that we're solving for. So we set the 16.4 feet of head we know has to be there, equal to the depth and the velocity head. So the only unknown in this function is the new depth y prime 1, because we know the flow per unit width, we know g. We're going to get a cubic equation when we rearrange things algebraically, and there will be a negative root, a supercritical root, and a subcritical root. And the only one of these that makes sense is the subcritical root of 16.251 feet. So the new depth will be 16.251 feet, and with that depth, there will be enough specific energy for the water to begin flowing over the obstacle at the critical depth. <coughs> so, that's the step-by-step -step for finding y prime 1. Does anybody have questions about that process? So, if it's, if it's like 14 feet, um, it's like not going to have enough energy to make it over the... Right, yeah, so what happens is there's kind of like a, a... It's going to occur over a period of time. Like initially, like let's say right now, the flow depth is 10 feet. And then just a moment later, that obstacle gets put in place. So the water level will immediately start to rise. And as it's rising, some of the water will flow as a trickle over the obstacle, but it, just very slowly. The water will flow over the obstacle at a slower flow rate than it's approaching the obstacle. So the water level will continue to rise. As it gets higher, the water will flow faster over the obstacle. It'll continue to get taller and taller and taller, but it'll stop getting deeper finally when the flow depth is that 16 point, um, 16.251. When it's finally up to 16.25 feet, then the flow over the obstacle at the critical depth, the flow rate is the same over the obstacle as it's approaching. So it's, it's like uh, you said, if the depth was 14 feet. Yeah, if the depth is 14 feet, then that means it's still in the process of having the water level rise upstream. It hasn't yet reached that equilibrium depth that's gonna allow enough flow to get over the obstacle. Are there other questions? Okay, let's skip over this ex example. Uh, it's just a variation on things we've already calculated a couple times already. And talk about contractions. Okay, so a contraction, this is a top view, and I gave you a homework hint that, uh, you know, already introduced some of these ideas. But let's say that um, it gets narrower. So what we're doing in this case if the same flow, big Q, is going through a narrower channel, then the flow per unit width, lowercase q, is larger downstream than it is upstream because B is smaller. Remember that flow per unit width, lowercase q, is Q divided by B. And so if B gets smaller, then Q, lowercase q, gets larger because of that ratio. So um, remember that if you have critical conditions, if the water is flowing at the critical depth, then the minimum specific energy is 3 halves or 1.5 times the critical depth. That's just that kind of uh, shortcut relationship that we know about, which is saying that the velocity head is one-third of the specific energy and the depth is two-thirds of the specific energy when the flow conditions are critical. So think about the uh, specific energy diagrams. So the diagram at location one is this diagram. This is the upstream uh, specific energy diagram prior to the contraction. So think about what does the contraction do? it increases the flow per unit width. And so if it's increasing the flow per unit width, so if Q gets bigger, 
if lowercase q is larger because the channel is narrower, then that means the critical depth is larger. And if the critical depth is larger, then the minimum specific energy is larger. So what happens is when the channel gets narrower, it changes the specific energy diagram. It shifts the specific energy diagram up and to the right. Because when you make the channel narrower, you're increasing the critical depth because you are uh, increasing the flow per unit width. And because you're increasing the critical depth, you're also increasing the minimum specific energy. So when you make the channel narrower, you have to create a completely new specific energy diagram. And so it's important for you to be able to reason through this process of what it does to the specific energy diagram. I may give you a question on an exam where I say, if the channel gets narrower, draw a new specific energy diagram. And what you'd need to draw if the channel got narrower is you'd need to say, here's the original specific energy diagram. If it's a narrower channel downstream, then that means the new critical depth is deeper meaning higher up on the diagram, and then the minimum specific energy is shifted to the right. Specific energy we can express in terms of velocity head, or flow rate, or flow per unit width. Any one of those three expressions will enable us to calculate the specific energy in open channel flow. And you don't have to have the same thing on the left-hand side as you do on the right-hand side. You could use V in the left-hand side of the specific energy diagram, and you could use lowercase q on the right-hand side of the specific energy diagram. <coughs> Sometimes it's just numerically advantageous to switch one for the other in terms of uh, simplifying the calculations. All right, so let's think about an expanding channel. If the contracting channel made the specific energy diagram move to the right and higher, then the contracting, and it was a contracting channel that did that, then an expanding channel like this is going to shift the specific energy diagram to the left and down. So the new, the, uh, how would the curve be shifted vertically? It would, if, if you want to reason through why and what's happening, B is larger, so flow per unit width is smaller if the channel gets wider. And since lowercase q is less, then the critical depth is less. So think about if the channel gets wider, how does that affect the flow per unit width? How does that affect the critical depth? And how does that affect the minimum specific energy? So this widening of the channel moves the specific energy diagram to the left and down. Sometimes when we account for the energy loss due to an expansion or a contraction, that uh, loss of energy is characterized by a, a loss coefficient, which is multiplied by the velocity head. So we're going to continue to use 1 as an indicator of the upstream location, and 2 means the downstream location. So 1 upstream, two, downstream, water is always flowing from one towards two. So in that case, the loss term is always on the right-hand side of the equation because the loss is going to say that there's a reduction in the specific energy that's downstream as a result of the turbulence and that occurs through the transition. So our book says that some typical contraction Coefficients could be from 0.1 to 0.6, depending on how gradual the transition is. And expansions are sometimes higher with coefficients between 0.3 and 0.8. So let's look. Well, no, it's 11.48. And I think I kept you long recently, right? By two minutes. So I'm, I'm going to pay back my debt. We're going to end here. And on Friday, we'll go through the calculations of this uh, expansion. So I'll see you then.